Okay, we're rolling. Uh, nature and extent of crime. And this PowerPoint is in your uh, in your module. We're talking about definition of crime again. We talked a little bit about that on Monday. The consensus view and the conflict view. Consensus, certain behaviors must be outlawed and controlled. And that criminal law is designed to protect us from social harms, from those who will do us harm, cause us injury. That's consensus. And if you think about it, the consensus, that's the majority. That's most of us what we want. Uh, law is the instrument that enables the wealthy to maintain their position of power and the control behavior of those who oppose their ideas and values and who might rebel against them and demand equal distribution of wealth. That's the conflict. We're going against the, uh, the norm. We don't want everyone to be protected from harm. We want specifically those living in higher standards, the one percenters. <coughs> Bless you. Thank You've you. heard of that term, right? One percenters? Okay, that's that, that one. And you see people out there protesting, talking about this. Uh, maybe? Maybe there's something there. This usually takes has, a minute. Has expanded and contracted over time to include and to exclude different behaviors. A useful example of this is homosexuality, which was criminal until the 1960s, whereupon it was <laughs> de down this day Anybody see it? Well, Start without your data. data. What's that? Start without or your data. Part of the definition without of my data. Under the blue box. Yeah. Another example would be youth crime. Bottom one. Yeah. Up this until 1998, youth crime was constituted <laughs> by criminal behaviors how do I get out? Committed by young people yeah, aged predominantly. Sorry about that. Let's just do this. This is a short one, but this guy did a good job. He's from the UK, but it still applies to us. Remember, we follow common law, and common law came from the UK. With a few exceptions, but other than that, we're very similar. Defining crime you hear presents the us with a series yeah. of difficulties and complexity because what we consider to be crime is a social construction. It's dynamic, contested, and contingent. In other words, what is crime, in inverted commas, varies over time and place. It isn't a universally agreed fact or a constant. It's a socially constructed and shifted reality. So, for example, the definition of crime in the UK has expanded and contracted over time to include and to exclude different behaviours. A useful example of this is homosexuality, which was criminal until the 1960s, whereupon it was legalised, decriminalised, and no longer formed part of the definition of crime, in inverted commas, because it wasn't a crime. Another example would be youth crime. Up until 1998, youth crime was constituted by criminal behaviours committed by young people aged predominantly from 14 to 17. In 1998, the age of criminal responsibility was effectively lowered to 10. So all of a sudden, 10, 11, 12, and 13 year olds were officially capable of being recognized as young offenders. And so the category of youth crime expanded, net widened. So when behaviors are added or removed to a definition, that definition inherently changes. And that's a difficulty if we want to seek a de agreed consistent definition of crime. It's also the case that what constitutes criminal behavior differs cross-culturally. So what we consider crime in the UK may not be exactly what's considered crime in other parts of the world. The difficulty here, or the tension here, is when we try to explain crime. 
if we're looking for, as a lot of uh, many theorists have looked for universal definitions of crime, so they can produce universal explanations of crime, but it simply isn't possible because crime is so dynamic. That's really interesting what you're saying. How do we define crime? We've been talking about it for a little bit now. Let's pick a crime and give it a shot. Murder. Murder. Okay, let's talk about murder. Murder is one of those natural laws. Remember I mentioned that term, natural law, that inherently we know it's wrong. We shouldn't kill someone. So that one we could follow back on ethics and morals and norms and history to take a lie. So let's get something a little simpler than murder. Go ahead. Stealing. Stealing. Okay, let's talk about stealing. Why is stealing wrong? Why is stealing wrong? Because we shouldn't, oh, well, because we're taking away something that's not ours. We're taking away something that doesn't belong to us. Why is that wrong? I really want it. Maybe I even want it more than you. Shouldn't it be based on desire? If I want it more than you, I should have that. Yeah, what do you think? I can hear stealing what? Stealing out of need. Stealing out of need. Okay. So if someone is stealing out of need, is it wrong? No. No. Why? Because just, okay, if I steal, yeah. I have the money for it. I can okay. pay for it, so that makes it wrong. Okay. However, if I saw a mother and a child that were homeless and okay. she was stealing formula, I, would, I wouldn't tell her anything. Okay, she's good. doing what she has to do to survive. She has to do what she has to do. So it's not wrong in that case. Now, the rest of you that really not participate in the conversation, keep in mind, how are we going to codify this? Because we've got to write the law Okay, for stealing. We already have one exception. Go ahead. I would just say for murder, there are continuing circumstances like uh, self-defense. Murder. Yeah. We're on stealing, buddy. I know. Okay. Uh, yeah, you want to yeah. bounce around. Let's yeah. stick on stealing. Yeah. Thank you, though. Yeah. I agree with them saying that like some people do have to steal to need, but when writing the law, I think it shouldn't exclude them because then we'd have a whole bunch of needy people stealing and without getting the reprimand. Think about that. Let me go here and then back there. Chance, right? The chance. Okay, over here. Alberto. Alberto. I'd say yeah. uh, people could exploit that with that exclusion. Uh -huh. Doesn't California have something made where homeless people, or people who steal over who are less than five hundred dollars, they can't be arrested? I don't know about that. Anybody 700, familiar? 700. 700. So if you steal less than 700 or X amount, you can't be arrested. Something like that, yeah. Okay. As soon as it's over 700, it's a better warning. Okay. I thought they just you can still be arrested. Yeah. But you'll be excused sure. down the road? As long as you get off the probation. Okay, so there's provisions for someone that steals less than 700, um, special circumstance. We'll leave it at that. They may not be prosecuted. Is that okay? Yeah. Is that good? That's still pretty That's still stealing, and that's $700. Go ahead, one more time. Well, I was going to say, um, they could put it as there will be no stealing, there will be consequences. However, that doesn't stop the people that work at the stores or that see what's going on for a certain reason. That doesn't mean they have to uh, like catch them. Or, yeah, like, discretion. Right. Yeah, they can use discretion to turn the other cheek and let them walk out. What do you mean? Mother stealing baby from you. Okay. Slippery slope. That's what that's called. The slippery slope. Well, she needs the formula for her child. I'm addicted to nicotine. I gotta have my cigarettes. I can't afford them. But she could have her milk. Why can't I have my cigarettes? There's a difference of need. Based on your opinion. But if I'm the smoker, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. No, no, no. Yeah, I completely. And that mostly, I agree. But there's going to be some exceptions that we're going to get to here in a minute. Remember, guys, we're codifying this. We're making a law for stealing. We already have a couple exceptions. Now, he's the vendor. He owns the store where they sell baby formula. He's got them up on the shelf. This homeless mother comes in. He can't do anything about it because she meets that special criteria. Behind her is another homeless mother and another homeless mother. And let's say there's 50 homeless mothers, and they're all homeless, they're all mothers, they're not playing the system. They come in, clean his shelf out of formula. Formula's expensive. I don't know how people are having babies these days. It's ridiculous. How much money did this guy just lose from his store? 
Where's he going to get that money? How's he going to recover it? He can only do that for so long. In a month or two, he's going to have to close his doors. Then he's going to stand in line with those homeless people. And he's going to be looking for a handout until they drive the next vendor broke, bankrupt. In theory, it sounds good. We want to help. That's human nature. Reality, when it's coming out of your pocket, that changes real quick. Would you continue to do that if you were the vendor? It's your store, your convenience store. I think I would do it if it's a specific person. But if it was mo it started coming mostly from other people, then that's when I would But they all meet that criteria you said. Right. Every one of them. Where they're, not, they're not playing the system. These are real people in need. There's a lot of them out there. And they're all lined up in your store. Mm -hmm. How long will you be able to do that? That's the problem. Oh, your chance. No, thank you. And then back to your point, you know, for specific people, watch out for certain kinds of discrimination because they're all probably specific. Ooh, I didn't even have to say that one, huh? It was just, I could just feel it. Probably. Yeah. Oh, it could, too. Well, you're showing preferential treatment. You're only allowing people who look like you to get the free formula, and people who look like this gentleman here, they can hit the ramp and forget it. If your skin's not the right color, you're gone. Right. Then what? Now you got protesters. She's president, she's racist. And you're just trying to help people in, in earnest. Uh, you had your hand. Yeah, uh, for someone in that type of situation, I would say suggest for them to go to do a little bit of research yeah. and look at nearby food banks and stuff like yeah. that. Because if you can, you can still talk to the person, yeah, even if they are stealing. So you can let them know, hey, you don't have to steal that. You can go to this place, they yeah. will give you what you need. They'll help you. There's yeah. there's people out there, resources, that are there to help these types of individuals in need. And there are some there. There really are. However, they don't have the money either or the resource because they're not properly funded. No matter how, and churches do a great job of trying to help uh, via soup kitchens and uh, food pantries. Our school has a big food pantry that tries to help people in need. But you can't help everybody. At some point, guys, people got to help themselves. Okay, you really do. Uh, and it's a shame, because I don't know all these homeless people out there. Uh, some of them are homeless by choice. Some have mental illness. Some have uh, some type of substance abuse problems. These are real issues. Uh, there is a proposition coming up for election that I saw that is trying to address that very issue. So read up on your props, make the right choice. Okay, so back to the crime. How fortunate or how well did we just define stealing? Well enough to come up with a, <laughs> did we do it well enough where I could put up on the board that we have a law? We failed as a class. And now we're asking our country, our state, to come up with a way to address these hard issues. That's why it's so difficult. It really is. Some, some people really want to help that have authority you know, in government. Unfortunately, there's those that only want to help themselves. And it's our job to keep them honest. Okay? Uh, let's move on. Again, how crime is defined. I showed you a slide last time that discussed some of these things and interaction is being. Social crusaders, moral entrepreneurs, uh, crime labels, life transforming events. That last one, interaction is few. There, if you do a little homework, there's a, a group of women, they were called the do-gooders. Back in New York, when children ran the streets and they figured, you know, we gotta help these kids. The idea was good, they were orphans. Uh, and so they did, they took them in, they created homes for these children and they tried to give them a life. That was the idea. It didn't take long for that to get corrupted. <laughs> they turned into slave labor and a few other things. But the concept was right. So you have people out there really trying to do the right thing. Uh, criminal labels. Think back to your high school days. For some of you, not so long ago. For others, it's been a little while. When an individual, and ladies, Please don't take offense, because I have to use this example, it's the only one I can think of. There's a girl that goes to our school, and she's easy. 
Everybody wants to go out with her because she's easy. And she's nothing like that. But a couple of guys started spreading the rumor and they put a label on her. How is that going to affect that girl? A lot. A lot. It's going to be terrible. And thank, I give thanks every day that I didn't grow up in your era. Because all this that was happening when I was in school, at least I could see and talk to these people. Now it happens in the secret of the damn internet. That cyber bullying and cyber this. And my goodness, please don't partake in that. And if you see somebody, stop it. It's not right. It really isn't. But labels specifically. In law enforcement, my experience, we call labels a jacket. Military guys, you probably call this something else. But if a guy was a loafer, we call them dump trucks, they're no good. That was the jacket they wore. That's what they're known as. Loafers. Nobody wants to work with them. Most of the time it was true. It doesn't make it right, but it's true. And it's difficult to shed that jacket, to get rid of that label. Now criminals, once they're prosecuted and they do their time, they pay their debt to society. They come out, all they want is, for the most part, a fair shake, an opportunity for a better life. You're the employer. You got four candidates sitting before you. They're all equal as far as uh, qualifications for this job. One of them, though, has that uh, prison record. Are you going to give this guy a fair chance? Probably not. It is because you just don't want to take that risk. They offended once, they'll do it again. And sadly, it's, there's, there's some truth in that. Look at the recidivist rates, out, out, off the charts. Yeah. I just remember that when I was 18. Yeah. I was military and I was trying to get a job and stuff. I wanted to get into the DEA and I didn't get no federal jobs as my uh, career. I had to get expunged and everything. Obviously, if you get expunged, they still can't hide it from the federal government. You know what so, my favorite one is? That if it happened as a juvenile, it stays uh, locked up or confidential. You can't, yeah, right. No, they can still see it. Sure they can. And oh, but they won't use it again. Oh, excuse me, but yeah, they will. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a question, like similar to like the whole stealing thing we did. Uh huh. Um, why wouldn't it work if someone just made a no exceptions law? A no exceptions for explain the law. What are we talking? As about? in like, um, like no special circumstances, like yeah. saying. That's the way the laws are written, right? Yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah. So why wouldn't it work? For that situation. Well, that's a law now. There's yeah. No, yeah. no there is no. But like for the, like how it is for California, where they have to steal above 700. So it's like. See, I'm not familiar with that. I have to do a little research so on it. So it's not that. It's under 700 is still petty theft. You can still yeah. go to jail for petty theft, depending on how many times you've done it, the price of what you did, yeah. what you did while doing it, in the area you did it at. Also, so it's because corporate corporations don't want to do that, so they rather get you with a felony at seven or about seven hundred. They rather get you. What well, you know, Cole, when they changed it, AB one hundred nine, maybe that fall back on that. Like I said, I got to look. They can up charge you too. It depends yeah. on your defendant yeah. if they're going to be able to lower or not. It's first time offense. Yeah, and remember, your lawyer is court appointed, just out of law school. Yeah, criminal justice is fair. Wow, it really isn't. It isn't. That's sort of the. Uh, Conflict view. If we went back to that other slide where people that believe in the conflict view do believe the wealthy can get away with murder because they can buy it. Absolutely. I believe that, yeah. And to a degree, it doesn't really bother me. And I'm embarrassed to say that, but it doesn't. It makes me want to reach that point so I can do that. It motivates me. Yeah, Chance. I really can't hear Prisons for rich people are different. Christmas? Prisons for rich people. Oh, <laughs> thanks. I was thinking you talking about Christmas again. Uh, no, prisons are different, absolutely. But not only for rich people. Uh, depends on the, the individual. Okay, there's a, it's a whole score sheet. I don't know if you're familiar. Depending on if this is your first infraction, your age, uh, your background. Are you educated? Do you come from a good family? Uh, are you secure? Do your parents own a home or do they rent? Did you grow up in the projects? Are you a minority? Uh, military comes into play. If you've already served in the military, those are positive points. But they develop a score sheet. 
and it goes up to 1 to 53, 54, broken down into four stages, levels 1, 2, 3, and 4. One is very low risk, and that's usually where the wealthy fall into because they are so wealthy. They've never really offended or they haven't got caught. Uh, so they usually fall into level one. And if it's a federal offense, that's what you want, a federal offense. They have the best prisons. They do have carpeting. They do have day rooms. TVs in there. I can't even call them a cell because they're rooms. Uh, one in Martinez by Benicia up north. I toured that one. They have a golf course. <laughs> Why? Because they can afford it. Donated by anonymous donors. Yeah. No, hell yeah. No, they got it going on over there. Uh, where I started in 1983 at this prison I told you about, we had a swimming pool. And we're level four, the hardest core inmate, mm -hmm. serial killers. We had everybody there, Just and we had a swimming pool. We had weight piles, you wouldn't believe. Uh, football field, we let the inmates actually play tackle football. And for a few years, we played against them. That was stupid. <laughs> Staff against inmates. But we did it, and a lot of dumb things were going on back then, yeah. Um, why wouldn't, like, is there like a law that, that would prevent um, people from donating to prisons no. like money to create that? Why? That helps alleviate the budget for us as taxpayers, or the feds, depending on what the feds are doing, no. Most people don't do something like that. Why are you even gonna donate to a prison? However, where I started, dual vocational institution. The whole prison was donated by the landowner. They wanted to do something for the community and give inmates an opportunity to develop vocational skills, to turn them into uh, good citizens when they got out. And for a while, it really worked. We had airframe mechanic, air engine, welding shops. And these guys, one in particular, went through the welding program. First he came in, couldn't read or write, so he had to go to school. Got his GED, then we sent him to the vocation. He developed a skill, learned how to weld. Then we sent him to a prison industry where he worked in the shop welding furniture. That was his thing, welding all kinds. That's all he did. He paroled with his certification as a welder. Got a job in the Bay Area, was working on the Bay Bridge and all the bridges out there. Did very well. I don't think he did the scuba diving part, but he wanted to. So in that case, it worked. It does work if the person wants it to work. And that's the catch. Most of them don't. We send them to prison because they're bad. They come out being bad and deceptive. Now it's harder to catch because it's better inmates. Uh, better criminal. Okay, so questions on this one, guys? Not too much. Oh yeah, marijuana, isn't it wonderful? It's now legal for recreational purposes. Uh, somebody asked me before, should we legalize other drugs? I remember that question, why not? Is alcohol really that much different than marijuana? I agree, I think it is. And I think tobacco is worse than marijuana by far. So why then are we willing to tolerate and excuse this type of behavior? Money. Think about it. Take it out of the underworld and bring it up to the surface where we can tax it. Make some money off of it. Gambling's the same thing. I think gambling's terrible, highly addictive, ruins families. Now I see these commercials on TV. Put the advertising, oh, I can't even think of the commercial, for MGM, yeah, they're really promoting, come on, put that $5 bet, we'll match it with $200, first time, guaranteed you're gonna win, and then underneath. If you have a problem with gambling, call 1-800-I'm-an-idiot, or something like that. <laughs> Why? But it's money, the evil dollar. Uh, Pink Floyd had a song out back in the 70s, money is the root of all evil, but I don't see anyone giving it away. Okay, money. Money, you can usually trace uh, crime back to the mighty dollar. Why? Because it's profitable. Do we get every offender? Can anyone tell me? Have we busted every single drug dealer out there? No. Hell no. The most powerful, right up your alley, are dealing in such high volumes. They don't care if it's us. Nah, they really don't. It's so profitable. The only way to curtail the influx 
of narcotics into our country. Anybody's taken economics, supply and demand, right? As long as there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. Address the demand so that nobody's going to purchase these types of narcotics when they get to this country. They'll quit bringing them in. You'll be out of a job. <laughs> that would be nice, though. That would be nice. Actually, uh, we didn't get home hits. We could have just caught it. Yeah. Radar and stuff. We get like trackers in some of the boats or ships and stuff. You know, in my brain, I always thought we would do the prosecution itself. Yeah. I thought like I feel like the government, DEA, has like their specified what well, they do, specified cartels they support more so. Yep. And then they like just to appease the government, they would give us. Tracking. Absolutely, yeah. Just Sacrificial lands, lands. Yeah. yeah, to uh, appease yeah. the people. Yeah. Oh, it's it's crazy. What's that one movie? Uh, America, where the CIA was protecting the cocaine coming in from Colombia to the United States. They're actually protected by the government. But yeah, there was sacrificial lambs, just so when people would make a, a, a big fuss, we're spending all this money, we're not even doing anything. Well, sure we are. Look, we just made a bust here and a bust. Are they giving us a couple little morsels to satisfy that hunger? In reality, we ain't doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, use that money to root all our evil, but yeah. not a lot of people know this. Oh, that's probably just basic knowledge that in 2008, drug money kept us afloat when the economy crashed. That's why the government doesn't really do anything about the drug, about drug bust. Marijuana, right back to marijuana. Why is it you have to pay cash? You can't use a credit card. You don't have to report it? Oh, and Chance had his hand in the up Go ahead. Banks don't want to deal with it. Yes. It's not legal. It's not federally legal. It's, it's not federally legal. legal. Yeah, so you can't do those transactions federal, only in cash. So why is it the feds haven't legalized it? Only California and a couple other states, a few other states. Think about that. California, we could ratify and pass as long as it doesn't go against the Constitution. We passed that. And this is a personal opinion, whether you agree with this or not. Okay, I'm not here to change your mind. I'm just telling you I don't agree with it. I think it's wrong. I don't know why they haven't changed it, but I, uh, I do know that anybody that's in a federal position, mm -hmm. no matter what state you're in, you will lose your, or you will get in trouble if you Okay, get, they'll take action against you oh, for, for it's using it. It's hard to even use, a, I used to want to, what is it called, what's it called? A, the little drops people use that for like a CBD, CBD oil. Oh yeah, the oil. Because yeah. I used to do mixed martial arts and stuff, and then my body would be aching all the time. We couldn't even use that stuff. They said use it, and there's a small chance it has any type of THC in it, it'll get, it'll get fired. So it's not working. It yeah. really isn't. So again, how is crime defined? We tried. This is what the text, the publishers come up with. Uh, through consensus, conflict, interact, interactionist views of crime, they differ, but there's some common ground there. They are all trying to still define it. Uh, the definition is constantly changing and evolving. It has to, okay, because we're evolving as a community. Social forces mold the definition. What's acceptable today, marijuana, 20, 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. Man, you're a dopehead. You're crazy. It was really dangerous. There's a lot of uh, negative connotation with the use of marijuana specifically. And criminal law is a social control function. Absolutely. This is how people are expected to behave. And we enforce that behavior by passing laws. Uh, so, oh, here it is. Adam Lanza, he killed 20 children. Uh, some six adults, Sandy Hook. This is one of many school shootings that have taken place in the United States, 15 years. So look at how the media covered it. Uh, how they define what a crime is and what is the general consensus by the public in terms of this guy's mental health. Okay, who's not familiar? You don't know anything about this guy in San Diego. Okay, good. So watch the video. I'll play it first, and I was going to play it last. But let me play it first. That way everybody's on the same page. There's one simple vision hack anyone can use to improve vision, so you can say goodbye to your optometrist for good. Police canvassing gun shops and firing ranges within 15 miles of Newtown, Connecticut, searching for more clues about the gunman and his mother. And tonight, some of those who knew them are coming forward to us with details about a young man who seemed to be unraveling. 
Here's ABC's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross. Increasingly, Adam was so troubled he would not leave the house. And his mother, Nancy, in the last few months, told friends she was losing control of her 20-year-old son. It was just getting a little harder for her as um, you know, uh, time went on. Nancy Lanson was a regular at this Newtown bar and restaurant, where the owners say she told them about her struggles with Adam's emotional and behavioral problems for years. She old schooled him and everything. So she, you know, like I say, I knew he was on medication, but that's all I, that's all I know. Since elementary school at Sandy Hook through high school, Adam was known by classmates as strange, severely shy. He hated looking into your eyes for more than a couple of seconds. He'd always look down at his paper or whatever he was doing. A former babysitter says he was told by the mother to never leave Adam alone. Never even go to the bathroom or turn your back on him at any time. The former school security director, who became close to Adam when he was in the high school tech club, said Adam had several disorders, including the inability to feel pain. So if he had cut himself or hurt himself, he would not know it or feel it. So we were being very, very careful with him. But despite Adam's issues, friends say Nancy Lanza took her son to local firing ranges and introduced him to the world of high-powered guns, including the Bushmaster AR-15 assault-style weapon he used to kill his victim. Demonstrated here in a video posted on the company YouTube channel, the Bushmaster can fire 45 rounds per minute and is the most popular style semi-automatic rifle in the country. Federal agents say Nancy Lanza bought her Bushmaster legally in March 2010, a model apparently tailor-made by the company to be legal, even under Connecticut law that supposedly bans assault weapons. Oh, okay, Brian Ross reporting in on his inv Okay. So that is what took place. Uh, he had the assault rifle and some handguns as well. Went into the school, shot it up, killed a lot of kids and some adults. You saw some of the precautionary uh, telltales that this guy wasn't wrapped too tight. So why would the parents introduce him to firearms? Okay, I got nothing. I have plenty of firearms in my house. I raised three children. Every one of them, as a child, I took out to the range and taught them safety. I was a range master and a master range master for many years. I taught safety throughout the whole state. And to my knowledge, I don't think anybody I ever taught how to shoot a gun shot themselves or someone else. Okay, that's all I gave. You don't want to hurt people, okay? You want to use it for self-defense. Okay, firearms. Firearms, this one's going to be very popular with you guys. Firearms do not hurt people. They don't. People hurt people. That just happened to be the instrument chosen. And it's a popular one. Uh, what's that, Smith? God made man, and Smith and Wesson made man equal. There's a poster of man. Equalized them. Anyone within a seconds can learn how to squeeze a trigger and aim it. If you could point your finger, I could teach you how to shoot relatively accurately in a very short period of time. It's easy. How to handle that weapon, that firearm, safely and securely without hurting people, that's the trick. How do you secure it when you're not using it? To make sure someone who's not familiar with a firearm get their hands on it. That's the trick. Okay, that's the trick. So if you oppose firearms, that's fine. Stick to your guns. Yeah. I was gonna say, I thought you were actually asking how do you secure it? Like like bolt lock, gun yeah. safe. Yeah. I think you what is it? So I think he knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I yeah. wasn't thinking he didn't know. No, I think he was uh, yeah, I, yeah. So if you're opposed to guns, you're a firm believer, guns kill people. That's fine, keep believing it. My stance is McDonald's kills people. Think about it, through diabetes, overweight, they're gonna have a heart attack. Cars, matter of fact, illegalize the fork. Forks are terrible, because that's what the instrument of destruction for overweight people, unless they're eating with tortillas, I like to. Okay, that's getting, getting silly. But that's my view on when I hear people say, oh, guns kill people. Uh, then what really ticks me off, I know I get ticked off pretty easy, is when I see these government officials advocating for gun control. Look around him, that person, who's Those protecting us? Birds. They're armed to the teeth. If you're such an advocate, then why do you have these people around you? Okay. Ah, that's me. Okay. so. 
This guy here, Adam, how did the media cover that crime? What are your thoughts on the media? Targeting the guns. Of course. They may victimize that poor gun. Yeah. Yes, they made it a gun issue rather than a mental health issue. Absolutely. Turn the public, the masses, into believing it was a gun problem. Because that's easy. That's something tangible. Yeah. Uh, well, to me, maybe I know it's probably not going to pop it you. It's OK. Um, to me, when I watched it, it seemed like they were focusing too much on his mental health, mm -hmm. um, rather than than the gun was just like a small factor in it. Mm -hmm. But it's it was focusing too much on him being unstable, yeah, um, enough to get a gun. So it's it's just they were focusing on why he did it rather mm -hmm. than the action he did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I noticed how they yeah they focused on his mental health and everything, but they also didn't. They mentioned that the mom introduced him to mm -hmm. weapons and everything, mm -hmm. but that was it. It was never, well, didn't the mom have, have it locked? Did it, like, what were they doing to avoid the child from actually getting his hands on it? There's plenty of, I only had a couple of minutes and I didn't want to use a lot of time. I could show you hours and hours of video, but we don't have the time. Please focus on those issues. Do a little research on that and see if you can come up with some answers. No, that's just like you said, it, um, the mom chose to have the gun. If the mom chose any other weapon, it probably would have been different. He would have chosen the gun, but he was shown the gun by his mom. Yeah. So, is there any... Yeah, go ahead. Do you feel like the gun control issue is complicated just like the homeless issue? Absolutely. Extremely. I don't believe everybody should have a gun. I really don't. There should be some type of regulation and definitely tracking as to who owns which gun. Absolutely. Mental health is key. Someone who has tendencies, uh, psychotic or psychosis, they should not be carrying a firearm. Yeah, I was gonna say, they should have like safety courses people have to attend to Absolutely. be able to buy. Absolutely, firearm. to handle that firearm safely. Uh, but as far as mental health, where do the parents fall in as far as culpability? Aren't they responsible for some of this action? Yeah. She frequented what? A bar, apparently not. Uh, <laughs> and left her son with a babysitter and told her, don't turn your back on this kid. But yeah, he's got guns in his room. Yeah. yeah she should have been more, she, she should have been responsible too because she knows her child was unwell. And Absolutely. Mentally. Absolutely. There's a lot of responsibility falls back on the parents. There was another article I read where the father was quoted as saying, Adam should have never been born. Hmm. Oh, man, I thought, wow. So there's a lot of good stuff that you could learn from this incident, but you gotta do the research on it. Uh, did they actually define a crime? Eh, yeah, slaughter. Uh, what was the general consensus by the public in terms of Adam's mental health? Really don't know. Uh, you said they focused a lot on mental health. I don't think they did enough. I'd like to know a little bit more what this, did he kill little animals as a child? Yeah. A lot of these school shootings, like all of them have the same pattern, especially yeah. with their mental like there's yeah. always big signs. There's yeah. There's always so how do you let your own child get a hold of any type of weapon? Because it's gonna happen. Sure. How do you put the child behind the wheel of a car? How do you know they're not gonna take that vehicle and drive on the sidewalk like in Vegas and run over innocent pedestrians? That's how I feel like the parents kind of do have like the res there it is their responsibility. Is. Absolutely. I feel like they should be held accountable as well because you saw all the signs. Yes. You're going to a bar telling people your son's insane. But you didn't do anything here. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, for, you said like the animal abuse thing. Do you know about the triangle of what makes up a serial killer? No. Uh, it's um, arsonist, animal abusers, and meth lovers. So they're a Is that 100% accurate? Um, it's the most common. It's the most acceptable theory? Didn't know that. Interesting. And you did the research on that? Yes, I was in forensics class. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Yes. Did you hear that? Can you, Chance, raise your voice, brother. We can't hear you over here. Oh, it's more like when they have siblings, they start like taking on the Siblings, okay. Abusing them to the point where Abusing siblings, okay. Yeah. 
There's signs. That's the bottom line. There is signs and indicators, like you mentioned. The parents. Yeah, where, where, where are they in this? After the fact, oh yeah, we should have. Innocent people got killed because you didn't. Anyway, let's move on. Didn't the mother pay though? She paid the price for everybody in this situation. Though. Didn't she? Didn't he kill his mother before he went to the school that day? I think there was something about that. Yeah, the yeah, there was something about that. When I see these heinous types of crimes in the media, I don't dive into them. I really don't. Uh, the television likes to, from I say, promote, not just report on what took place. They promote it. They twist it. Uh, they sensationalize. And then you get the copycats. Yeah. Over here, man. That's why you gotta look for unbiased uh, yeah. reporting. Yep. And it's difficult to find. That was part of my job. I had to find unbiased reporting. That's a tough job, yeah. man. Yes. Well, I think not only like when you watch these things on the news, do they like kind of promote it, but also yeah. if you watch movies like Goodfellas, casinos, things like that, that definitely because I was show those movies, I know at way too young an age. Yeah. And I was always taught go for the bad guys. Yeah. Partially why I'm in this class. Yeah. But it's kinda like it does promote it because when I was younger I was like, Yeah, like I wanna be a shit. I wanna go yeah. and own a casino and oh, like yeah. all this stuff. But then it's also like no, because then you also see the aftermath of like, hey, this is what happens, but they don't always show that. And that's why so many people, I think, like that kid could have seen things like that that they're not talking about. That the mom was like, oh, yeah, watch what you want. But it promotes it. Lack of parental supervision. Okay, so violent crimes. What are the different categories? There's some up here. Different categories. We have to categorize crimes in order to prosecute them so we can assess uh, penalties. So if somebody's being charged with a homicide, and is looking at spending the rest of their life in prison without the possibility of parole versus someone who went into a, a convenience store and took a box of formula for their child. Are they gonna receive the same penalty? No. Absolutely not. So there's, uh, the consequences are in the penal code. It used to be, and we're not talking about this yet, it used to be indeterminate sentencing. Indeterminate, meaning the court got to decide after hearing the facts and the defendant was found guilty, the judge had the authority to say, okay, I'm gonna sentence you five years to life in prison. Now, this individual gonna do about two and a half, three before they go before the board of prison terms. And the board is made up of ex-wardens, experts in corrections. They know what they're doing. They review this individual's case, called case factors. What has he done since he came into the prison? He's working, he's staying out of trouble, he's doing what classification is telling them to do. Okay, come back in another year and let's see what you're doing. And they'll give him instructions what to do. So he might end up five years and the board decides when they're gonna release this individual. This was about in the 70s, that's the way it was done. So what happened at this point too, if the prison starts getting a little overcrowded, the prison classification would look at low level offenders people they thought should be kicked out. So they would call the board down, the board would review the cases, and if they needed 30, 40 beds, they'd find 30 or 40 individuals they could put out on probation. We could monitor them that are outside and use the bed space for a little bit more serious offender. So all of this was controlled by the board through indeterminate sentencing. Then legislature kicks in, California specifically saying, we know better what's best for the public, more so than this body of experts. So they change from indeterminate to determinate sentencing. Now in the penal code, if you look today, it'll tell you, for a burglary with these types of circumstances, you will serve four, five, or six years. And now this is just an example, guys. Four, five, or six years. Now when this person's found guilty, they go before the judge. And the judge has to determine is it four, five, or six? Okay. Aggravated would be the six. The expected would be in the middle. And the mitigated is the lower term. Okay. That's all the authority the judge had. Hands tied. So now this individual sentence, and we're going to give them the expected term. They're going to go to prison for five years. They get day for day. 
For every day served, they get a day off their sentence. Good time behavior. On a five-year sentence, they can get out in two and a half. It's all done by bean counters and records. They determine when this guy goes home. They don't care what type of behavior he's demonstrated while in prison. And that's how these violent people keep getting released so fast because of determinate sentencing. You had a thought or something you want to add? Is it true that the, the judge can like give you more time than what's recommended if he sees it? Not anymore. No, because I saw something recently where like this kid broke into a bunch of, he stole a bunch of cars yeah. and the prosecutors recommended him to get like, let's say eight years. Yeah. And the judge gave him 15. No. So I, this is like just on the news. Okay, so I don't know if it, What state? I don't know. I was yeah. in California. I'll have to look again. Okay. But maybe it was just a recommendation. Maybe in the law he could give 15 years. But the guy jumped over at the judge or no? No, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, that's, and that's legislature regulating what type of sentencing can be issued. Okay? And they did it with good thought. Uh, what's it called? Good, fair, something fair sentencing law. Where they wanted everybody to get the same sentence for that same uh, violation. The intent was good. The outcome was ridiculous. Our prisons grew. And that's when I started. Uh, we had 12 prisons when, in 1983. I think we were 11, 12, 12. And by the time I retired, we had 32, 33 in that short span. We've closed a couple since then because of AB 109. They restructured the penal code. But yeah, it's crazy, guys. So the violent crimes, if you look in the penal code, the judges have to issue whatever the sentence is, special enhancements. Maybe there was some enhancement that added on more time. Uh, it just came to me. Okay. okay. So if you use, say I go to the liquor store and I'm all masked up and I threaten this uh, shopkeeper, give me all your money. And I don't display a firearm or anything. I just look pretty intimidating. And he gives me his money. Okay, so I'm guilty of that crime put my finger in my pocket and I simulate like I have a gun, but I don't. And I say, give me all your money, I'll shoot you or something like that, right? So then he gives me all his money and I leave. I get caught. My finger just got me a special enhancement because he believed it was a gun. It doesn't matter what I had. If he believed his life was in danger because I had a firearm, I could be found guilty of a deadly weapon right here. If I did have a firearm, that's still the enhancement. Okay, now maybe I belong to a gang. I did it for the furtherance of this gang's activity. That's another enhancement. And everyone carries additional time. Okay, so five years for the robbery, two years for the firearm, two years for the uh, gang affiliation. I'm doing a little bit more time than I would have under normal circumstances. Gang violence. I spent oh, uh, in juvenile justice class. Oh God, I think it was like a week or two weeks with the class. And we tried to define what a gang is. What is a gang? And we wrote, every, I put, put them in groups and they wrote their research down. We put it on the board and then we'd agree on what we thought. And we came up with a definition of what a gang is. It took us two weeks. And by the time we were done, then I put up next to it what the government classifies as a gang. And we were almost dead on the money. It took them years. Our class did it in two weeks. Very proud of that one, yeah, not bad. But if you try to find a gang, what is a gang? Why do we have gangs? How do we stop the growth of gangs? Good luck with that one too. Serial killers. Uh, okay, serial killers and mass murder. I don't see mass murder up there. Right? That's right there, okay. okay, there it is, mass murder. Okay, yeah. Uh, mass murder and spree killers, serial killers. What's the distinction? Serial killers are more targeted. The frequency of which they kill. Frequency, Pattern. they're targeted. Patterns of how the you patterns. Okay. Frequency, patterns, uh, their MO, uh, method of operation. Serial killer. They're killing one or two people at a certain time, certain interval, and they meet a criteria and that's what the FBI likes to research and figure out if they could identify this killer. That's what a serial killer is. Spree killers kill on the spur of the moment, more than one individual on one occasion. Mass murders, uh, like that Vegas shooting, uh, 
multiple targets, multiple killings, but at one time. It's just so you kind of get an idea of what the difference is. Uh, intimate violence and hate crimes. What do we mean by intimate violence? There's, okay, okay, there's another. Yeah. A little bit. Domestic abuse. Yes, domestic abuse. That's what we're talking about. You know the perp, uh, you probably have a relationship with them. They could be a family member, a loved one. Intimate violence. Hate crimes. What's that? Racially motivated. Yeah. Racially, religiously, gender, sexual orientation. It, it's really just a, a blanket excuse to target these people. Hate crimes. It is about time they're taking this more serious and prosecuting it as an enhancement, not just as a regular crime. Uh, how does the media influence our fear of crime? What does it take to be a champion dancer? It takes a mind. I think if you look at the way the media covers crime, you know, there's a pretty steady drumbeat of criminal justice stories on the local news that doesn't really adjust to what's happening in terms of crime rates. So there is always a huge chunk of any local newscast devoted to crimes. And that's true whether the overall crime rate is rising or falling. And so one thing that does is create an appearance that crime is always on the rise. And if you look at polling of the public, the public does think crime is always on the rise even when it's falling. So that's one issue. Another issue is that the media likes to highlight certain kinds of crimes in a newscast. So, you know, really the grislier, the better for purposes of TV news. And as a result of that, you have the public thinking about these serious crimes when they're thinking about criminal justice policy overall. They might not be thinking about lower level offenses or the complexities of why someone might commit a crime. You know, they just have some horrific image in their mind that they might have seen on the news or social media. And the other thing we get from media coverage uh, is very racialized. You know, the media tends to cover a lot of interracial crime, even though my, most crime is intra-racial. And that also ends up feeding into various stereotypes and prejudices among the public when it's thinking about crime policy. And, you know, that too affects then what policies are ultimately adopted. So you end up with public that's you know, very prone to be afraid, and it means you have a public that's more likely to support some very harsh responses to things. But what would be better would be if the media spent more time talking about what works to reduce crime. You know, what, what would be the right approach if we're seeing crime on the rise or we're seeing certain kinds of behaviors the public would like to see stopped? to really analyze what works to do that. And that you don't really see a lot of discussion about or coverage of. Okay, agree, disagree? What are your thoughts on that? How the media covers crime. Was she speaking truthfully or is she twisting things? Yeah. I would say the there is an argument from politicians Wait, from the media argument. that the UK is more specifically, the youth justice system in England and Wales has a youth crime problem. And I'd say this is not the case. The youth crime problem, in inverted commas, is a social construction, largely driven by politicians. They've created the image, the representation of the problem, and exaggerated the extent and nature of youth crime to the point that it seems, there it is. Okay, we'll just leave it here. Okay, so go ahead, I'm sorry. You were saying? Uh, that the media news, social media is that, it's more of what makes a story interesting. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what they're using now, and why a lot of people why? don't. You're right. Their sponsors want the numbers, they want people watching. And if they're watching this horrific broadcast, sponsors are going to support it. Money, again, I'll pause down to money. Uh, you had something about that? 
Oh, that's just what I was going to say, is that that's their job. That's how they get paid. The more views. Yeah, exactly. It. Look at, if anybody still gets a newspaper, the headlines, you're never going to see anything positive. It's going to be negative. World climate is changing. Polar bears are dying or, I don't know, whatever. But just to get that interest. But I also think they do, um, they do kind of post or talk about a lot of crimes going on that they've caught. So it shows kind of the audience like, oh, look, even though that this crime was going on, we caught them, so don't worry, we're on it, when in reality a lot more goes on. And it ends with vote for me, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you live here like to spread fear? Spread fear! Because like, for, like in California, yeah. like, we have the big one, and when it was talked about, that's all they talked about, and you know what's going to hit, and then everyone just strikes fear. Yeah. Uh, also, when COVID-19 hit, uh, they COVID. made people go get toilet paper for some reason. They cleared out the shelves. That was crazy, yeah. So that's a good way to like, spread fear. Social, yeah. How many of you have Facebook? Yeah, wow. Okay, Facebook. Uh, one of my youngest daughters, this was a few years ago, was actually telling me things that were happening. And I asked her, where, where do you get this? She goes, Facebook? I said, are you serious? And it wasn't even a post from a source. It was something that was being multiple posts from friends and family and twisted and changed. Oh, she was swearing by it. I can't remember what it was. But it was so ridiculous. Uh, crime trends, real quick, she did mention crime fluctuates. And it fluctuates depending on the economy. We have a nice, good, healthy economy, crime goes down. We lose jobs and we're not doing so good, crime goes up. So it's all interconnected. And who are most likely to be victims? Women. 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 People what? Of minority. People of minority. So a woman who's a minority. Anything else? The elderly. So it's like kids. Kids. Okay, kids. What age? What are we? What are we? We're talking about two years old, three years old. They're going to be a victim of a crime. Okay, two, three years old. Elderly. Elderly people and single, elderly. And single women. Elderly is the least likely to be a victim of a crime. And I don't know what the age is. Forty-five or fifty is the cutoff. Yeah. Uh, low class. Low class. Okay, that would be my brother. He's got no class. Uh, no, you pe people live in poverty or whatever. Usually, it's male, teen males between the ages of about 12 to 17, 18. Um, minority, uh, either Hispanic or black, one or the other, but a minority. And they live in poverty, boroughs, urban. Okay, urban. That's about the three biggest factors to be a victim of a crime. Anybody can be a victim at any time. Just depends on the perpetrator's need. That's all it is. Uh, you can buy the best security in the world, but if somebody wants to get in, they're gonna get in. If they wanna cause you harm, they're gonna harm you. They'll find a way. Okay, uh, let me pause this recording. Take roll and then get you guys out of here.